bring the room to order and welcome all of you. It's great to see you all, particularly so many folks from natural sciences and the applied research lab and some of our some of our less traditional parts. So we're we're delighted to have you uh, to have you here today. Uh, on behalf of the uh, the uh, Brumley Fellows Program at the Strauss Center, the Intelligence Studies Project, uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, you know that the drill that we follow with the Brumley Speakers Program will be one of our fellows will actually introduce the speaker and kick off the program. I just wanted to remind you of a few events. We're obviously in the in the meat of the fall semester. Uh, you've seen all the posters and all the people we're bringing to campus. I'll share with you my my uh, my uh, wish list for uh, events in the next couple of days. Tomorrow we have here at the LBJ School we have Daniel Danielle Pletka from the American Enterprise Institute talking about Middle Eastern realignment and the security of the state of Israel. Uh, next week I'm hoping to stay around school on Wednesday afternoon for uh, General John Allen, who will be here, former ISAF commander, currently president of the Brookings Institute. And I'm <coughs> skipping over a number of other interesting speakers just because of sharing with you my list. And then the week after that, for those of you who'd like to mark your calendars on Wednesday, the 24th, we're going to have um, our senior fellow and the university's distinguished scholar, John Brennan, former CIA director, will be doing a conversation with Mark Updegrove over at the LBJ Library. So it's a really busy time, and we welcome you to all of our uh, events. So uh, with that, I will call on Kingston Burns, who's one of our Masters in Global Policy students. Uh, he has the unenviable task of working with me uh, this academic year, and he's going to introduce our, our speaker today. So. All right, welcome everybody. It is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Cadlick visiting us today. Uh, he's currently serving as the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. After a more than 20 year career in the US Air Force and Special Operations community serving as a surgeon, uh, he spent a significant portion of his time focused on public health and biosecurity in a wide variety of roles uh, as the Director of Biodefense on the Homeland Security Council and as a Special Assistant to the President George W. Bush Administration for Biodefense Policy. Uh, I think we're gonna hear a little bit more today about the new uh, biodefense strategy, under which Dr. Cadlick serves as a coordinator for one of the teams focused on domestic readiness. His career has spanned the White House, uh, the Senate, where he served as the Deputy Staff Director on the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, and at the DOD. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert Cadlick. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. First of all, hello. First of all, I have to apologize. I have a little raspy voice. I think it's, I think it's the uh, live oak mold or whatever. But um, hope you're all doing it well. well. Um, this is a welcome diversion from hurricanes, which I seem to be involved in quite a bit. The latest one being Michael down in, uh, in Florida. So after I finish up the class with uh, Professor Pope, I jet back to Washington just in time to watch all the mayhem and catastrophe unfold. So anyway, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Professor Slick, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I had the privilege to work with Professor Slick in the White House during the Bush years. And um, again, you landed on your feet again here, so this is great. Uh, I will acknowledge two people in the audience. Uh, Colonel Air Force retired, Randy Larson, good friend of mine, also a bio expert. Uh, and someone else who unfortunately has a strong resemblance to me. I will not point her out because I'll embarrass, embarrass her to death, but she is a Longhorn class of 2022. So she, uh, I, don't, I don't think she cut classes, but she came here, so thanks. All right, um, so this is an interactive briefing or conversation. So I'm gonna start off with saying, what is biodefense? And you can read it for yourself. But it's the whole idea that you need to basically counter biological threats, reduce risks, and prepare for, respond to, and recover from them. What are they? They could be biowarfare, bioterrorism. They could be a crime. They could be a natural or accidental event like a pandemic. So a wide variety of things that quite frankly <coughs> creates, if you're interested in diversity and if you have ADHD like me, 
there's always something new going on. And, and that is really the challenge of this domain and this discipline. So we're gonna start out with a question. Who was the first president to institute a biodefense policy? First one, there's a prize. Sir? George Washington. Oh, man. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Here you go, buddy. <laughs> There'll be another one. So, yes, it was George Washington. And uh, he wasn't president then, obviously, but he was head of the Continental Army. But big problem during the Revolutionary War was smallpox. And they had to basically protect the soldiers, the American Continental Army from smallpox. And they developed the process before Jenner created his vaccine called variolation. Does anybody know what that is? You take a pustule from a smallpox victim, you grind it up, and then you sniff it like snuff. Now, if you're not one of the three to five percent of the people who actually get smallpox and may die, you're gonna be protected. But that was an affirmative answer to an affirmative threat back in the 1700s that uh, Washington did. But the real president who started the whole thing, if you want to talk about it, is FDR. And what's interesting about his story is that <coughs> at that time, we had experienced World War I, we had the experience of chemical warfare, but biowarfare itself wasn't very well recognized or appreciated. There were concerns, quite frankly, at that time, the intelligence said, which was exactly wrong, that Germany had a bioweapons program and Japan did not. In reality, after the war, we learned the exact results. So if you're guessing, sometimes slipping a coin is not bad, but this is not an indictment on the intelligence community. This is a hard problem. But here's the thing. FDR basically started our declaratory policy against biowarfare basically with a bluff. We did not have a bioweapons program. And that's why he called it U.S. response to the excess use of poisonous gases would be full and swift retaliation in kind. We had chemical weapons, we didn't have biological weapons. So, so winners have already won, don't get the next prize. Sorry. So we know who the father of the WMD nuclear program in the United States was, right? Oppenheimer. So anybody can guess who the man on the left with the shorty on, the shorty tie, who that person is who was the father of the U.S. Biological Weapons Program. Anybody know? You may own stock in his company. You may take some of his medicines. DuPont. George Merck. So George Merck actually prosecuted the second Manhattan Project during the war, which was really based on the idea of the concern that we would have to deal with this. Now, at the end of the war, they did some things that were very specific and very, uh, let's say, advancing for the cause. But in the end, they really couldn't really confirm one way or another, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not this stuff would really work. And so this, first of all, this was an interesting report because the report was released unclassified and it caused so much commotion and concern in the public domain. And in our previous conversation, we were talking, where I was talking to some students, talk about the fear factor, it scared the bejesus out of the American public, public that they actually classified that report after it was released in the open domain. And it also created another thing which uh, Colonel Larson has a great sometime in the future for those who are interested. We actually started doing human testing. It was Operation White Coat. <coughs> it was the actual means by which we would actually expose volunteers to non-lethal agents to establish what would be the effective dose, what would be the effects, and basically, again, demonstrate it. So, very significant set of issues. Now, the guy here who really kind of moves the ball forward, as I say it, is Ike. He takes over as president in 1950, reaffirms retaliation in kind, if they were to be used against us. But then, a couple things happened that changed the view. One, using Operation White Coat, they actually demonstrated in an open field setting that they could infect a company of soldiers with a non-lethal agent that said, hmm, this may work. <coughs> Second thing, which was a big thing, was then Field Marshal Zukov said in any future war that Russia would fight or Soviet Union would fight against the United States, they would use chemical and biological weapons. 
And so here's an interesting story. Eisenhower knew Zukov. Knew Zukov was a man of his word. At which point in time, Eisenhower changes the policy and says, we'll use it to the extent that it advantages us. And the president, because he's a retired five-star general, will decide when it will be used. And then there's a series of interesting studies that basically at least start conjuring up the strategic value of these weapons. So in an NSC meeting at the end of his tenure, he's briefed on that there are new advances in chemistry and biology that may permit controlled temporary incapacitation. And this could be a new form of warfare. <coughs> and he said it was great. This is a great idea. I love it. Except that if we use it against the Ruskies, that they would probably respond with lethal agents. So there was this issue that, like nuclear weapons, you could be faced with escalatory responses by your adversaries. So this gives you an idea of what they were able to demonstrate in 1959. <clears throat> they basically took an airplane, put a, ta put a tank on it with liquid agent, and basically were able to demonstrate that they could cover an area of 50,000 square miles. Picture that in your mind. That's like Rhode Island. That's like almost Connecticut. So what, what the capability that was represented here <clears throat> was far more, not destructive, but effective than a nuclear weapon. And in some ways had the advantage of not destroying the infrastructure if you so desired. Because people would get sick, the buildings would still stand, and arguably you could walk in and take over it. And so even though this study was done with liquid agent, the program was really looking at, hey, what would happen if we could do it in, with dry agents? So if you had 40 gallons or 40 pounds of an agent, that would give you the approximate equivalent coverage. <coughs> Even in the late 50s, <coughs> they saw the benefit of using these capabilities with cruise missiles, drones, drones, UAVs, back in the 50s, as well as special operation forces. And so this was just kind of an interesting kind of evolution of thinking that was done not only in theory, but empirically by actually doing these tests. So you may ask, how good was the science? Well, anybody know the American Society of Microbiology? That is the preeminent organization of scientists, microbiology, microbiology scientists in the United States. It was formerly known as the Society, uh, the Society of what was it? Society of American Biologists, SAB. So it worked out 20 of their presidents served in one way or another in the bioweapons program. And I'm an example of this. And quite frankly, some of these people did huge things for the development of the pharmaceutical industry in the United States, like Ira Baldwin, who's the first technical director of the program during World War II, but basically demonstrated how you make on scale things like penicillin, antibiotics, other biopharmaceuticals that quite frankly revolutionized healthcare and saved lots of lives. But there was a standing committee of these folks who basically would provide their personal and professional advice, notice problems without any of the moral, political, or military aspects of BW. So they're brought together on a quarterly basis up at Fort Detrick. They'd be given a problem, they'd say, ha this is how you fix it, and off they'd go. They were never encumbered by the moral piece of this until later on. So this advisory committee basically dissolved in 1968, <coughs> excuse me, not because of bioweapons, but because of Agent Orange. Fort Detrick also made the defoliant used in Vietnam, and that created a lot of negative press for the whole complex up there, and it was a division of the bioweapons program that made 24D and 245T that were used to defoliate um, much of Vietnam. So this gentleman here, Riley Housewright, served as the American Society of Microbiology. In the same time, he was the technical director of the offensive BW program. Here's an interesting, this, this came out of his files. His, this is his archives. Their job was to translate policy into reality. So this was a top-down program, as you'll see here in a little bit. We developed it from scratch, and nothing had ever been done on the scale, and it was supposed to be and notice the two things that we're looking at. 
One was a defensive program and the other one was a program of deterrence. So we were out, we were trying to prevent the Russians and others from using these weapons. And so that is why we went to a scale that we did building places like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, which produced clearly metric tons of materials. So for those who are not familiar, two parts of the program, strategic deterrence. We had lethal strains of bacteria, tularemia, multi-drug resistant antibiotics, vaccine resistance, anthrax plague, all the nasties, and they were able to do this um, uh, in a way that was before genetic engineering. So they did it empirically. And then to, to President Eisenhower's demands, they had a role of these other things in capacitating agents where they could use these things in low intensity conflict if you wanted to do this in a way that you could kind of get, put everybody down and then sort out who the good guys and the bad guys were. So it was a very interesting kind of approach. So the operational objective of those two guys like Riley Housewright was, you want to get really, you want to really get hot agents, right, Dr. We really want hot agents. Things that are very virulent, deliver them by aerosol, use them in overwhelming doses that shorten incubation periods, overwhelm immunity, make them resistant to conventional treatments, and actually mix them. So you'd use multiple agents to confound diagnosis and frustrate treatment. So think about these, think about a microbe as a fighter airplane for a moment. Think about it, right? You want to make it more lethal, you want to make it stealthy, and, and so the same thing, the same principles we're taking to biology as they were doing this in the 50s and 60s. This just gives you an idea, this was the uh, science advisor to uh, President Eisenhower that if you could do this, this is from uh, White House documents, the idea is that you could basically infect all these people in all this area. Now, for some, quite frankly, they saw this as a humanitarian way of waging war, that you wouldn't kill them, but you just make them sick. In many cases, you can make them sick from things that didn't need specific treatment, and time would tell in terms of their overall recovery. The problem was, the problem was, that what happens about the highly vulnerable populations? The very old, which now I'm part of, the very young, what would happen to them? And, and reality was, is you probably kill them. And so that was really one of the moral objections ultimately that led to the termination of the program, but I'll show you more here in a minute. So who worked in the Pentagon? Anybody work in the Pentagon? A couple people, right? So 1965, from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the J-5 plans a policy. The letterhead has not changed. Good news, right? <laughs> These three paragraphs highlight what would need to be in the President's budget for, our, or for research and development, testing and evaluation, and they basically identified the need for a policy to develop operational capabilities, the ability to use this in Vietnam, and there were actually plans that were developed to use this in Vietnam that were used. And the last one to me is the most interesting one. Can everybody see it or can read it? If you can't, I'll read it for you even as raspy as I am. Indication of the proposed efforts to explore the technological feasibility of strategic biological weapon systems as a means of broadening the spectrum of US strategic strike capabilities beyond nuclear weapons. The potential degradation of nuclear strategic systems which are expected to result from the recent advances in anti-ballistic missiles, 1965, makes a biological strategic weapon system an attractive possibility. So we were considering that one way to maybe circumvent the Russian missile defense was actually employing strategic bioweapons. Now, the good news is this got put on the shelf. And I'll go into a little bit of that. But it's only appropriate to acknowledge what the namesake of this building, his role in all this, is that at a time when the nuclear test ban treaty was not only signed but put into force, the United States was conducting large area live agent tests in the Pacific with a variety of agents to demonstrate unequivocally that this stuff worked. Now, this was part of a deterrent strategy, because the Russians knew we were doing it. 
And it was demonstra you know, demonstrating to them that we had game in this as well. And so it was, if you want to call it effective, you can make your own judgment on that, but that was part of this process. The other thing they did during LBJ's time was look at the vulnerability of our system, places like the Pentagon, places like the New York subway system, places like presidential, the White House. And what they found out is that we were very vulnerable. So if, if, if we ever got to that point in actual use of these things, we would take a licking as much as we could give a licking. And again, in Johnson's tenure, and in fact, one of these days I'll come back and get into the stacks, he signs a, plan, a defense planning memorandum term, terminating the lethal arm of the program. And that sets up to this point. So this is a question. Which president signed the executive order 11490? Anybody guess? 11490. Based on giving the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare the responsibility for national body defense. Any guesses? Okay, Nixon. He basically did it a month before he had the NSC meeting where he basically eliminated the, the incapacitating program. And so this was the thing that he said, you know, and it was basically on the moral issues about incapacitating agents were not incapacitating if you kill several hundred thousand children and elderly. There's no, there is no benefit to that. That was a lot of this that was going on there. But if you recall in 1969, it was at the cusp of the biotechnology or the perceived biotechnology revolution. 10 years earlier, a guy named Josh Lederberg won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for identifying the genetic uh, means by which you can transfer antibiotic resistance between bacteria. And so it was a sense that there was something in the offing that was significant, but in some ways that that would be something that would probably challenge our national security rather than enhance it. And so you'll see why that happens. So, you remember Riley House, right? This was his input into that national security process. He wrote a four-page memorandum that said it's a strategic weapon, particularly focused on civilians and economic targets, agriculture, that you could cover big areas, that we've demonstrated this both in humans and in field environments. And the real challenge is here is sometimes it, goes, it works too well goes a little bit further than you expected because it's subject to meteorological conditions. The one thing to take away from this is these are not natural diseases by design. And so when you to say we're gonna use a Ebola vaccine for Ebola outbreaks, that may not be effective if you're focused on an Ebola weapon that exposes you to high, high doses of Ebola virus or other factors that may enhance the virulence of that organism. And quite frankly, Riley House Wright makes the point that intelligence isn't perfect. And they monitored the intelligence a lot. But they felt like one of the best hedges against uncertainty was actually do testing. Now, I'll back up one, because that was a major issue that was subject to the conversation in the NSC back in November of 1969. How do you prevent technological surprise? So, just to give you an idea of scale, this is kind of like getting to the business case for biodefense today, is that if you look at an improvised nuclear device, it kills about 1.2 million people, but so can anthrax, Ebola, and Marburg at a fraction of the cost. Uh, plague into <laughs> the same way. Um, a, uh, a, the radiological dispersal device, and this is sarin. So it gives you an idea that for anybody who really wants to get an edge on us, and they don't have the technological sophistication to make a nuclear weapon, you could argue that some of this could be maybe done easily by someone else by doing other technologies. So this is a slide that, <clears throat> to highlight the business case model, that was shown to President Bush back when we were there in June of 2008. And when we said to the president, Mr. President, uh, you know, there was the anthrax event of 2001. 
bunch of letters, one gram of anthrax in here, number of people needed treatment, number who got sick, number who died, the cost of cleaning up $1 billion, plus or minus. But if you looked at what Al-Qaeda was interested in doing and using anthrax maybe against the major metropolitan area, this would be the potential risk. A lot of people exposed who may not know they're exposed. A lot of people who would need to be treated who may not know they need to be treated. But once they become clinically ill, the numbers that are represented here would basically swamp the hospital system and those people would effectively die from their disease because you didn't have the means to respond and, and treat them. But look at this, projected economic cost. This is done by the Council of Economic Advisors, $1.8 trillion. Now, how does that work? Well, that's loss of life. It's also done on the basis of, quite frankly, the fact that you have an area that is now contaminated with a persistent biological agent that you're gonna have to clean up. Now, if you can do it in six months, which we couldn't then, probably can't do now, the number goes to an astronomical number because why? Because retail owners, people who own property will abandon the city. They'll say, well, can't, can't use that again. And so it becomes a real economic burden to deal with these kind of challenges that are quite different. Remember, the infrastructure is preserved, but it has to be cleaned up. So <clears throat> here's an interesting uh, piece of history. Again, Riley House writes uh, archives, the White House press secretary's um, statement. Biological weapons have massive, unpredictable, and potentially uncontrollable consequences. His handwriting, not true. They may produce global epidemics and impair the health of future generations. Not so. I have there, so the thing is, in some ways, and I can't get anybody to confirm this, that at the end of our program, what we did was do two things. We terminated our offensive program, largely for moral and practical reasons, right decision. Second thing is, we, we basically worked with the Brits to basically develop the Biological Weapons Convention and make it into a draft that didn't have verification measures to it, but still was a total ban on biological weapons. And, and I think a part was to try to force the world into the, into the mode saying, these are bad things that nobody wants to get involved in. I think the strategic, however, issue was technology was driving this down a, a, a plane that we see today that not that anybody can, but the technology and information is out there so that anybody who is dedicated to this purpose could do it and do a lot of harm. Now, second part of the uh, piece of here, and this is from this public statement, was the reference to the BWC, Biological Weapons Convention, that would not limit us, not limit us, to basically do the things that we need to do to protect ourselves. And that was also part of the NSC prep meeting for the president that Kissinger chaired, that you need to have some kind of defensive program that will allow you to evaluate the risk of biological events to basically propel your defensive efforts. And that is a, a very specific clause in the Biological Weapons Convention today because it prohibits things that have no peaceful or prophylactic purpose. So the peaceful prophylactic purpose clause is really reflecting the U.S. interest in this to maintain a scientific technical edge to at least limit the risk of technological surprise. So let's talk about Bush 41. So after Nixon, kind of like we've solved that problem, move on. Bush 41, basically Iraq invades Kuwait. I shared with somebody today that my first day at Fort Bragg at the Joint Special Operations Command had two things that were significant. One was Stan McChrystal got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and the second was Saddam invaded Kuwait. And the risk was that he had biological weapons. And <coughs> the intelligence, to the credit of the intelligence community, was actually very good. Thankfully for some people in the room here that made it even better. And so we had a pretty good idea what it was, but we didn't know where it was. And so they actually started, and I, uh, they started murdering, surging production in March of 1990. That's like, think about it. They invaded Kuwait in August. 
They were surging production in March. A dedicated commitment to basically develop these weapons for use. And then, according to Saddam's own words, according to the Saddam tapes, that he actually released the authority to use these weapons and they were dispersed to auxiliary airfields, as you'll see here in a minute. So here is our disposition of US forces in 1991. This was before the left hook. This was the pre prevailing meteorological conditions. This is a video of an Iraqi Mirage F1 spraying a bi uh, biological simulant of anthrax in early January of 1991. So this was found, by the way, in 1995. But it demonstrates that they had game and they were prepared to use it. Now, what would happen if they were able to launch one airplane? They could effectively put a lot of hurt on us because at that time, our allies, even our own soldiers, didn't have enough means to protect themselves with vaccine or antibiotics. And so that would have been a real world of hurt. <coughs> by the way, these slides I just showed, <coughs> they were actually used by Secretary Perry in 1996 to brief the NATO defense ministers about how we missed the bullet in Iraq in 1990. So, okay, quiz time, another chance to win. Which president said this? I'll let you read it. Anybody be getting a guess? Prize. Clinton, any other guesses? Hey, George H? President Saddam Hussein. <laughs> See? Could have been a winner. But that said, he understood the nature of the world that we were confronting better than we did. And so you mentioned Clinton. This is what he did. He did a lot of good stuff. He was very concerned about the risk of proliferation from the former Soviet Union and a book written by uh, Richard, Preston. Preston. Richard Preston called The Cobra Event and a letter from a Nobel laureate by the name of Joshua Lederberg, who said, we better get our game up on this. And so he did, he did certain things that really made a difference. Started the process. Okay, here's a big one. Which president, prior to 911, wrote this? We need stockpile of antibiotics. We need to develop and deploy sensors. We need possibility of attack to avoid total panic. Who? Which president? Biodefense is a world of surprises. So, the American response to bioterrorism and the risk of biowarfare and the risk of pandemic influenzas is reflective of a thing that is the nature of our government. Imperfect incrementalism. You can use that one, Professor Slate. That's a good academic term, yeah? And the point here is, in black are congressional legislative mandates on the subject. In red are what our White House uh, or executive branch mandates on the subject, with the two most recent ones being the National Biodefense Strategy of 2018 and the reauthorization of the Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act that created my position at HHS. So let's do some mapping. So in the Bush administration, the preeminent policy was around counterterrorism and WMD, and we had three basically approaches, non-proliferation, counterproliferation, consequence management. In the Bush administration in 2004, wrote the first national biodefense strategy which looked at these pillars. And then subsequent to that, you had a further articulation by the Obama administration in 2009 for preventing, uh, countering biological threats, and some other things in here. So the National Biodefense Strategy, signed by the president on 18 September, uh, basically replaces some of that. But here's the thing you got to take away from this. It is a vital interest of the United States to manage the risk of biological incidents. <clears throat> vital. 
I don't think that comes around too many times other than maybe in nuclear constructs or maybe cyber constructs, but it's vital. Now, now I'm going to be a little bit of a curmudgeon. I'm going to be a little bit of a skeptic. Because as I shared with uh, some of your colleagues earlier, and I won't give you a guess on this one, we invest $7 billion a year on protecting America from these threats, which we'll go into a little bit more. That is not even half of an aircraft carrier. The Gerald Ford, their latest US aircraft carrier, is $17 billion. We spend about $7 billion on this stuff. And by the way, we have 10, at least 10, I think we have 11 now, carriers. So think about it. So this is, this is a point where I shared with the earlier group that you know, now that there's policy, you better put resources around this, otherwise it's rhetoric, right? So this is what the new biodefense strategy did, eliminated this band, this band, and basically identified five goals. Increasing awareness, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. And if you haven't read it, it's a fairly lengthy, detailed tone. <coughs> But it does outline what needs to be done. The role of the National Security Advisor is to lead a policy review that once this is signed, as it was in September, next spring, actually summer, there'll be a review by the NSC of a, a process that's chaired by my boss, the Secretary of HHS, with the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Homeland Security, and the Secretary of Agriculture to basically look at how adequately we have aligned our programs and our investments behind these goals. So it'll be a chance to basically re-equilibrate, hopefully, as I say, get more money, to basically make a lot of these efforts more substantive and sustainable over time. So I'm almost done, but I want to leave you with this. <coughs> who's who's right? Black Swan. <coughs> Pardon me. It's a good book. It has nothing to do with bio. But if there was a chapter in bio, <clears throat> it would highlight the fact that if we had a major bio event today, it would be like, oh my god, where did that come from? It would have a major impact. But as the facts were known, you'd say, oh, we should have known it was coming. And, and the really, the thing here is, the, the bottom line of the book is about preparedness. Same thing about cyber. We talked a little bit about the comparisons between cyber and bio. <coughs> Many similarities. Obviously, cyber is happening every day, right? People are raiding your bank accounts and all that good stuff. But this is the one where we don't want anybody raiding our gene banks, right? So here's it is. We can't reliably predict Fox One events. I suggest we need an insurance policy. An ounce of prevention with a pound of cure. But the point here is, if we don't build this, we're going to be SOL should we ever be confronted with it. Now, here's the funny thing. When I was in Korea about three weeks ago, there was an imported SARS case in Korea from Dubai. Same time, there were two imported cases of monkeypox in London. So these things are happening every day, folks. And we have the Ebola outbreak in DRC right now that's going on in Indian country, and we can't get people there to basically stop the outbreak. So we're kind of living in this world where, again, we're kind of whistling in the dark a little bit. But one, I think, quite frankly, we do need some more thinking, strategic thinking about this. You know, one of the areas that I know is the domain of this program, and Professor Slick and Professor Pope represented, is really the intelligence side, which is vital. How do you? How do you make a good judgment on this? We've been good in some cases, not so good in some other cases, but with the, the, the democratization of biology, where it diffuses around the world, how can we be more sensitive? And it's nice to know guys like Dr. Leduc from Galveston are doing their part to actually promote the idea of prevention. The idea of how do we work with our colleagues internationally to make sure that they can understand what the risks are if they don't safely manage they're highly dangerous pathogens. And accidentally or deliberately, those things find their way to the wrong people. 
So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for being a great audience. I still have one coin, but, <laughs> so, but we're, now the next version will get through. Okay, thanks. Bob, you can manage your own questions. Sorry, right. I, won't, I won't use a laser pointer. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who, who has a question, sir? Uh, in the five uh, principles you outlined, what about number six, retaliation? Well, I mean, that is not stated specifically in there, but I think that's a reasonable thing. You know, I, I can't speak for the administration on that because it's not, I think it's in the national security strategy more than it is in the biodefense strategy about if you do this, this will be a bad, bad end to your day, but it's not explicit to the biodefense strategy. Sir. Since you mentioned Iraq a couple of times, did either Iraq or Iran use biological weapons in their war in the 1980s? Well, they used chemical weapons for sure, and there are some reports that would suggest they may have used the biological toxin. May. I don't know if anybody else wants to offer any more comments on that. Sir? Does the biodefense, uh, the latest biodefense policy, does it, uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about offensive biological weapons by state actors or even potentially non-state actors, does that address other risks, biodefense of, uh, you know, increased uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, it, you know, as human populations meet wildlife for the first time in expanding uh, cities? Here. Arguably, it's a lesser included case, yes. Okay. Scale, scope, and speed are the principal differences. Yes, ma'am. Are there particular technical limits that stopped? Uh, Saddam from using the biological weapons? It's called the U.S. Air Force. Okay. <laughs> Achieved air superiority and bombed the hell out of those critical targets that made it impossible for him to employ those weapons. But why not just, I don't know, put botulism toxin everywhere? Just if you got them in time? Well, I, I, I don't think he had a chance. He was, <laughs> from time zero, he was cut off. So any of the chances that he had wanted to use those? And we have his voice on tape actually saying that. And he basically gave release order for that. Well, so can we, I just say something on that? Sure. We, we, we worked really hard to get those bunkers early, and we gathered specific intel on how to keep the bunkers from venting. <coughs> and one of the first briefings that Schwarzkopf gave, he showed a, a weapon engaging, and that weapon had been made in the last six weeks to keep from aerosolizing what might be inside the bunkers. Yeah, extraordinary tech, extraordinary means were used, sir, and then it's simulated. So maybe too broad, but what do you know about parallel biodefense programs you know, that are developing kind of across the world right now? You know, we, like the Chinese scientific infrastructure is kind of developing, coming to the fore. Are these politically motivating for them? Or, uh, when you say politically motivating, can you define that a little bit more? They perceive a biological weapon program <coughs> or a biological defense program, they need one. You know? um, so the thing is, is they view, so they live in a tough neighborhood, number one, with the Russians, A, B, they have uh, pandemic influenza circulating every day around them. And so they, they take this stuff serious. But Dr. Ledoux, do you want to comment anything on your experience with the Chinese? Yes, ma'am. Um, somewhat similar to that, can you talk a little bit about some of the benefits and potential challenges of working on this issue in a multilateral sense and what this looks like within the international community with both allies and adversaries? So obviously some things you can work better with others. And so some of our classical allies work very well in the space. <coughs> Excuse me. I think in the multilateral space, maybe biodefense in its deliberate sense is not as appealing as the concerns about natural endemic disease and pandemic diseases. So there's plenty of room, plenty of space to work with people on this. The challenge is, is basically doing things that are complementary and are capacity building, which is critical. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the biodefense strategy, is there an approach to ways that we're passively making ourselves more susceptible, like increase um, prescription of antibiotics or anti-vaccination campaigns? All those things have an impact. I mean, on just daily stuff, right? Risk of antimicrobial resistance. We're on the verge of basically being in the in the pre-penicillin era because we basically squandered the use of these antibiotics, not only here but internationally. On the vaccine issue, yes, there's disinformation about vaccines. I mean, there's some very powerful messages around that. 
as we know with the autism issues, those were based on faulty scientific journals. <coughs> Sir? You mentioned just now the challenges of increased drug resistance, so how do you address something like that from the preparedness and response angle? So, three things. <coughs> One, we need to develop more new class of antibiotics, which we are. It's part of Carbex, that's part of BARDA, one of my organizations inside, is investing with private sector partners and global uh, non-government funds to basically try to promote the development of new antibiotics. Second thing is promote the idea of judicious use of antibiotics. People are one thing, animals are a different kettle of fish. So that is probably the biggest issue in terms of the risk, is basically using antibiotics in such a fashion in livestock populations that you actually promote antibiotic resistance that actually then impacts the human race. Any other questions? So, uh, like, as far as agents go, you know, you talk about how you can distribute an aerosol and expose a lot of people, right? Um, but are there other agents that exist where it's like you could give it to a small number of people who could give it to more people who give it to more people? Um, yeah, it's called measles, pandemic influenza, plague, smallpox. Something for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, there was somebody here. Sir. So I want to ask a Rizzo question since I've had this discussion with him. Um, we have to look in the security at the, the legal parameters that we have to operate within. And we've had a law conference here every other year filled with JAG people and even some FISA judges and things like that where we discussed all of these problems with cybersecurity. And all you need to manufacture an RNA virus that has high lethality and high transmissibility is the code. And biotechnology is moving at astounding speeds. Everybody, every once in a while, somebody in those conferences where we'd be arguing about whether you can reinvent <coughs> the existing law or whether you have to replace it with new law, but nobody ever talks about how long that process will take. Sometimes people mention Moore's Law, but the biotechnology is moving at at least twice the speed of Moore's Law. And those biotechnologies, for example, somebody that's making $2 million a day off of selling bootleg oil as a caliphate, can buy that technology dirt cheap, and they can manufacture their own <coughs> RNA virus and infect the world with it because they don't care. So we have, to, we have this problem of the legal parameters that we have to operate within here, uh, within this country, in the security industry, and how we're going to deal with the technology that's evolving so rapidly that the only thing that's limiting the rate at which it, it evolves is the company making back their investment by selling what they made before they roll out their next product. I can't agree with you more. Jimmy, are you in the room? What do you think? Uh, I think there are <coughs> technical challenges uh, of detecting this border RNA <coughs> and it starts self-replicating. Uh, it, it is a concern. And it's, it's not too far, but it's not something I think that can be done in a cave right now. Could it be done in a university setting? Absolutely. Yes. So the rule is don't live in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my apologies if this is too simplistic a question, but I saw on your slide with the anthrax, an anthrax attacks that the economic toll was really big and it really surprised me. What kind of things go into that, that cost of what seemed to be yeah. like a smaller scale? So it would be um, per life lost. There's a value to that about seven, eight million dollars. Then there is disruption of economic activity in a given area. People going to work, transportation, groceries, da da da. <coughs> it, that's not a simplistic question at all. It's a very involved calculation that they did to basically determine in a given metropolitan area what would be the economic impacts if people couldn't go to work or were in a position where the economy stopped entirely. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the 2018 biodefense policy that was drafted up, um, did it include like a very concrete strategy um, to prevent and respond to chemical 
biological warfare attacks on the U.S. and is that part of, or is it kind of open-ended and is that part of the reason why it's difficult to <coughs> Well, it's in there, but it's stratified across a number of domains. So collectively, you'd have to kind of look and say, what would, if there were a scenario X, what pieces of this would be in play? But yes, all the pieces are there, but they're not necessarily aligned to a, what happens if Y happens? This young lady and that gentleman. So <clears throat> you're talking a lot about national policy, but in the international sphere, what region actor do you see most threatening? And then what actor do you, or region do you see most vulnerable to these kind of attacks? Well, I, I think, <coughs> pardon me, let's start with the vulnerability. So places that don't have a well-formed health infrastructure, places in Africa, Asia, South America. So there are a lot of, even our country would be vulnerable, depending on the agent, transmissibility being one of them. So if you had to look about in the world that we live in today, I mean, some of the usual actors, the concerns around the, the major state competitors, Russia, maybe China, Iran, North Korea. And so I think those are things. The wild cards here are really is whether terrorists who move out of the cave and find a university to work at can effectively do this in a way where they can do it long enough because it, it, it takes a fair bit of time and skill to do this. Could they, could they achieve that? And we know in some cases they've tried and failed. And in some cases we know people are still trying. To me, the real wild card is the accidental thing. Do-it-yourself biology, somebody in their garage, working with attenuated flu virus, fiddling around with something or whatever, and oops, not even, not even aware, end up with something that's not good. Sir. Well, I think the thing is, is you have a general erosion around this, whether it be in England or in Syria or other places around the world, you have an erosion of what are the norms around these kind of use of these agents. You know, it's, it's, I won't say it's easy. Chemical agents are, certainly get notoriety because they're fast acting and bam. And so if you think about Kim Jong-un's brother, where he got hit with a binary, maybe VX agent in uh, Singapore, I guess it was, or Gualapur, Gualapur. That's, that's one scenario, but you know, the biological agents, man, there are biological outbreaks every day. So if somebody said to me, there's a suspicious outbreak of a biological event in Syria, and I go, yeah, who's gonna go investigate it? Who's gonna determine the epidemiology of that thing to say whether or not it's a suspicious event? Remember the Rajneeshi event up in, up in Oregon? It, it took a couple of years after the event. CDC said, well, it looks like a salad bar. You know, well, that's, that's great. <laughs> but it was only when they basically rolled up one of the, the people who said, oh, yeah, we did that. It's usually like potato salad. Good. Um, I want to ask about sort of broad <coughs> economic policy and maybe required legislation, that kind of thing, to, if, if you go back to sort of the Cold War days of preparation for nuclear war, so a lot of for example, industries that we wanted to maintain. Um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, for example, the capacity to rapidly develop vaccines and, and field those. And then also our data, you know, our genetic data and that kind of thing. I was wondering if you could connect those. Sure. Well, one of the things the strategy has a specific call out is the economic benefits of not biodefense, just bioeconomy. And that in some ways, if we can grow that bioeconomy, we can help solve some of the biodefense problems, but also grow our economy. So there is a wedge in that, and there's a big call out for innovation in the strategy, which is kind of unusual in the sense of typical strategies, but it says we need to innovate in these spaces. Because, as I'm finding out in my current position, some of the things we can innovate in can actually have benefits, you know, benefits to other parts of the healthcare industry. How to manage people with dialysis how to do better things with infectious diseases, like sepsis. So there's an economic piece to this strategy. 
To your point about the genome, well, you know, the thing is, um, I have not given mine up. <laughs> I was asked earlier, actually, by Professor, Professor Slag, <coughs> pardon me, whether or not he, whether or not I perceived what China was doing around sucking up all the genetic information to be potentially nefarious or commercial oriented. And I use the great quote, as I will use again now, from Charlie Wilson's War. As the Zen master said, we will see. But I think the key thing here is there's great economic benefit to be able to do, as the trend line is saying, to personalize medicine, to get information on large numbers of populations so you can actually see where there may be some opportunities to do some genetic interventions that could maybe address diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or some other diseases that have significant impact on society. So, sir. With respect to nation states, to what extent is there cooperation, agreements, et cetera? Uh, so. I'm sorry, the last word you said. With this whole area of... Um, I, I would say it's, it's variable. Uh, the Biological Weapons Convention is one forum that meets regularly on these issues, but it's been scant of progress in the last 10, 15 years. So where it's, I think, been more productive is uh, allies of mutual interest and concern with basically working together. I don't want to foreclose questions on biodefense if, if there's some others, because I want to take Dr. Cadillac in a slightly different direction. Sorry for the... Uh, the surprise turn, but when Kingsley introduced you, he described your your most recent position uh, as the Deputy Staff Director of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. A lot of the folks here in the room study and are deeply interested in the oversight of our intelligence community. That's been at best a mixed story uh, in recent years. But uh, and in November, as you know, we're going to host uh, the uh, the uh, chairman and vice chairman uh, of the SISI, and so. We want to ask some questions and also celebrate to a certain degree what we what we think is happening there in terms of some oversight. But you're one of the architects of this. Can I ask you to just sort of map out um, the approach that you and and the members on that committee sure. designed to do the kind of democratic and diligent uh, oversight of intelligence sure. that all of us know it requires. So, so what's going on? What works? What doesn't work? What's the design? Well, here's, here's what works. <coughs> Oops. Excuse me, sir. It does not show you. No, it doesn't. Oh, booger. Oh, man, yeah, I'll say it to you. I'll talk it to you. Here it goes. 35, 35 <laughs> professional staff members on the committee. 15 members on the committee. So remember the members have bigger important things to do, but the 35 <coughs> professional staff on the committee who are oriented 18 for the majority, 17 for the minority. And so that's one more for the majority. That's, that's how that works. And then there are four staff people that are security admin and other stuff. So it works out very nicely that you have 17 agencies you have to monitor. So you could basically say, if we use the NOAA, make pairs, you know, bring, you know, you know, bring me two of everything, <clears throat> we could organize the staff, which we did, in a bipartisan fashion, saying there's a CIA monitor and a CIA monitor for the minority, the majority minority. You guys work together. You're going to have hearings on your subject areas, on your agency, four times a year. But we also know that there are many functional areas of interest to the committee and to the members. So cyber, WMD, China, Russia, terrorism. And so we put all these up, rank ordered them, and basically then split the portfolio across these pairs and then populated a, an approach that included, hey, we got to get a bill passed. It's called the authorization bill for the intel community. That has to happen in June. And then we back it all up and we say, okay, and here was the fun part of the job, honestly. So two people had a portfolio of things, of an agency, and they, you know, they may be matched at an, on an agency level and then work with somebody else, which was really the intent, on a functional level, like on WMD, you'd work with somebody else from the minority. 
So you basically matrix this whole town <coughs> with the intent that they had to work together. And so I had to be the slave master and said, okay, um, and it was, we had a 60 day calendar, actually 90 days. But when we got to 45 days, it was pretty solid. I would turn to both of them and say, you're gonna have a hearing on WMD, China. You're the WMD guys, you're the China people. Put together a two pager that talks about what, the, what are the critical objectives of what needs to be reviewed, who are the critical witnesses we need to have, and come back to me in 48 hours with it. And so basically what they did is they'd scurry off. The four of them would, you know, you know, we want to do this. But what it is is really build a more collegial environment. We all work in the same skiff. There are no walls that divide us. And so it really kind of enhanced what I'd say the professional working relationship of the people. And it gave them enough time to actually think about what they wanted to do and what were the important issues that they thought the members needed to hear. So previously, in the previous management, it would be the chairman would say, I want a, ter I want a terrorism hearing next week on whatever. ISIS in Syria. And so here it is, everybody scamp around and you know, in seven days try to do that. But if you gave people 30, 45 days to think through it, you get a good product. And so we managed to have, <clears throat> in a given week, two hearings and a briefing. The briefings were re relief valve in, in some ways. The other, I mean, I was gonna say the fun part of this was, you guys, the intelligence community does a great job creating these calendars. You know, different parts of the world, like Kim Jong-un's birthday, you know. <laughs> it's celebrated. <clears throat> and say, hey, you know, and, and we know in December is Kim Jong-un's birthday. Let's see if he's going to pop a cap or a bottle rocket, and let's, let's have a hearing, you know, right before that. And it would be an opportunity to say, here's what's the latest indications and warnings on maybe something that's going on. And then there would be, let's say he does pop a cap, then you use your briefing to basically say, okay, in 30 days, so you, went, you basically fed the beast, the, the members, kind of get them that they have, they have knowledge of something that's gonna happen. And then when it happens, it always takes like 30 days to pull all the pieces together, right? And so then you have a briefing for the members on this. So ultimately we ended up with 14, 14 or 15 members at every hearing and every briefing. Because they saw it was value added, it was content rich. The staff was happy because it was their product. They worked together, and it was my job to be the referee and the taskmaster. Is where's your two pager? So that's how it worked. That, that's absolutely terrific and very, very thought provoking. So, so you've answered the question of bipartisanship. How, how you address that? Um, but to your point of oversight. <laughs> Say again? Oversight? Yeah. So I can speak certain, I can talk around this a little bit. So the Russian intervention to Syria was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> and so what we were able to do was bring in people to say what was the nature of this and then do a very concerted, detailed effort between CIA and DIA and the other entities to say, well, what did you know? When did you know it? Why did you know this? And, and that was kind of like an example of oversight. Yeah, so, so we gave you credit for it, dealing with the bipartisanship, and that makes, makes perfect sense. The committee also didn't leak, doesn't leak much. And so how'd you do that in 2017, 2018 <coughs> in Washington? The, the counterpart committee on the House sir, is a sieve, and most of the rest of the body is. And so what was different about life in the Senate Intel Committee that caused people to want to keep the secrets? And, and the, relation, the, yes. the relationship between Burr and Warner, which is real and, and serious, and they both made a commitment. If anybody leaks and we'll find out, they're out. And there have been a couple people who have leaked. Did you say I have some nominations? <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was with prejudice. So and they enforced it. Credit to the leaders in that case. All right. Thanks for tolerating that detour on intelligence oversight. But. <laughs>
I just want to go back to what was mentioned here about the problem, the finding a true epitope and creating vaccine within two months to, all, to, to actually achieve containment, or at least part of containment, once you've got something broken out, whether it's naturally occurring or intended. Um, you said $7 billion. The drug companies and the manufacturers, Lilly being an exception to some degree, have been unwilling to get back into the vaccine business. We have some vaccine development institutes. We have one right down here in San Antonio, and we have the biodefense lab down there. But um, it was they didn't do it because it just wasn't feasible. There wasn't enough capital in it to make it worth their while. So where are we on that with $7 billion in funding in terms of developing vaccines fast enough to do something? And, and what, what sort of future plans can we well, get into that? Great question, and here's the reality. Big Pharma ain't involved. Right. Little Biotech is. So they're willing to basically contract contract, and, and take the capitalization to basically grow their technology and hopefully create a countermeasure that with some of the money that we have, seven billion, about a million, is set aside for procurement. So it would be a guaranteed purchase. If you make the finish line, you get it. Now, a billion dollars to Lily, those guys is not, right? Sure. But that's, I mean, but still, that's suboptimal. It isn't that the, the purpose of P3, PRISM, and some of the other programs is because pharma's not doing it? Right. And the thing is, we're, we're like in part of we have this drive initiative, mm -hmm. which is really about innovation and, and being able to use venture capitals, venture capital techniques to basically fund emerging technologies, emerging companies to, to basically get them get them moving so that we can help them get to the finish line. Sir. So one of your last slides said that spy incidents are no longer a public health problem under their national security. Uh, could you elaborate on where that line or overlap between uh, biodefense and public health? Sure. You know it when you see it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. If, if, it, if, if it starts affecting people's ability to, you know, the economic piece, the social piece, if they question the, the credibility of the government, those are all things that are outside public health domain, but like the Ebola crisis in 2014, that, you know, that was a public health problem, but it had national security consequences. Impacted immigration, impacted economies, impacted everything. And so that is a very small scale thing, right? But you know, you know if you had 100 cases, Rubro. Thank you, Dr. Kappa.